Hey there, we're going to configure NAT pools. So I'd recommend that you watch my previous video on basic NAT configuration. I go through that and how to set it up. I also have other videos on how to set it up in the past. But uh, with this, I've got real equipment and a, a real web server, a real uh, uh, Windows computers running. So it's uh, way more fun to see it in action than a, in a simulator. So. With that pools, it's a little more tricky to understand, and I'll show you why. So here's a configuration. It's just like the previous video, except for I changed it up a bit. So what I did was, um, I still have inside IPNet, inside and outside. Still have the access list to define our traffic that we want to translate. But um, what I did was, I created a pool of addresses that our ISP gave us. So, for example, uh, your, your ch uh, service provider, whether that's CenturyLink, Charter, Time Warner Cable, whatever you go, whoever you go through, level three, might give you a chunk of addresses. And usually what might happen is they, you know, you have a connection to your ISP, whether that's, you know, fiber or your Ethernet, whatever, that terminates to, uh, to the building, to your building, and they'll just have a static route pointing to you or whatever saying, hey, these block of addresses Chuck them out here, and then they'll chuck it all the way to your um, router in your in your building, right? So we're going to define that pool of addresses our ISP gave us, okay? And then what we're going to do is IP NAT source list one. So we're going to bind our source addresses. We want to translate our hosts. We want to translate them into the pool of addresses that were given to us, right? Instead of before, we're translating it to the interface our public interface, now we're breaking away. The hardest thing for me at first to realize was um, using, translating to an address that didn't exist on the router, right? Because in my mind, everything worked out perfectly. The routing and, you know, all the stars are, were aligned and everything made sense. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wait a second. <laughs> we're translating to a pool of addresses that doesn't exist on uh, any interface, really. Just kind of floating there. And it's like, what? So we'll get to that. I'll show you that. Um, but then I use the overload command, right? If we didn't use that, um, we would only have two computers <laughs> on our private network that would work, right? The first computer would go grab one address, and the second computer would grab the other one, and then that would be it. <laughs> so with the pool, uh, uh, with the overload command, we can now have twice as many as before with one address, right? Once we run out of ports, unique ports on the first public IP, we can use the second one, dot two. And then with the ISP, all I really did was the ISP said, hey, this block of address, addresses here, chuck it out to my client. And I am 98.0.0.2, which is really weird. So break away from that concept of uh, being stuck to that interface, right? So what happened is our ISP points to us a static route of 200, 200.0.0.2. .0 .0 .0 zero slash 30, right, a static route to us. And on our um, NAT configuration here, on our router, client router, we have a pool of addresses, right, that we defined to translate to. So it's just kind of floating there. So we'll, we'll run through the logic real quick, but let's see if this works. So we'll go to our virtual machine real quick. We'll open up a web server. We'll go to our web server, and it works. So let's see the NAT translation that was created when I uh, accessed the web page from here to here. So what happened? So we'll go to the client router. Um, I believe it's this one. Show IP NAT translations. I spell it right. <laughs> so as you can see, our inside local address 10.0.0.50, our client computer, what's translated into that inside global address, it was translated into 200.0.0.1. Now you're probably thinking, that's so confusing, right? The packet gets to the router, right? It gets translated as it goes out. The source address is no longer 10.0.0.50. It's now uh, 200.0.0.1, and it doesn't exist anywhere. And you're like, what? As the packet's going out, but bear with me. As the packet goes out, the ISP really doesn't care about the source necessarily. It just looks at destination and sends it to the web server because that's what our packet is, is addressed to. 
gets to the web server, okay, gets to the web server, the web server says, okay, well, I see it came from 200.001, so I'm going to check it back to my ISP. And then the ISP is going to know where um, it gave the 200 block, right, because it has a static route we set. Oh yeah, you know, ISP says I gave out this 200.0.0.0 slash 30 block to this client, my customer over here. So it chucks it back to the client. Now, this router receives a packet with the destination of 200.0.0.1. It looks in its little NAT table and says, oh, I, I have, you know, I have that address. Um, let me go ahead and translate it, right? So if we look at the translation, as it comes back, it's going to say, oh, that's me coming back to that port. And it's going to chuck it then to my uh, my uh, inside host with this address, right? It's going to translate the destination from 200 to 10 here. So all that, I mean, really matters is that, that route coming back, really. I mean, RSP gave us a block of addresses. Again, it's a static route to us. And NAT did the translation for us. It didn't have to be, you know, on the interface, right? With the normal NAT, when you first learn it, it, makes perfect sense to translate on the interface, right? Because it goes to this interface and it's addressed to dot two. I'm like, yeah, of course it makes sense. But then when you use pools, <laughs> it kind of you kind of have to break away. It's almost like it's floating on the router. And I think that's very it's kind of hard for some to understand at least for me. Like, wait a second. How is it translating because it's not like wait a second. My my router, I'm given 98.0.0.2. How does the 200? How does it <laughs> it's like after a while it finally clicked, it, you know, it it uh nat happens before any routing so once it gets it it translates it it's like oh <laughs> so that's how it works so um you can do that with uh, a few other things so that is how uh you can configure uh nat pools and i recommend watching i have some other videos on that tool uh too but this is more a real world example i have like a web server running and you get to get to see it in action so I hope that was helpful and thanks for watching.